Welcome to Midweek Bible Study. We're glad you've joined us online. And we are in part five of our series called The Spirit of Elijah. We need to review what we've talked about for the first four parts because it's been a little while since we've been here. And then we're going to get right into part five. In 1 Kings chapter number 18, God sent a man called Elijah to the king Ahab to make sure that he set things back in order. This whole series has been talking about God's man of the hour. Elijah was God's man of that hour. And idolatry was rampant. The king was wicked. He had a wife named Jezebel who was promoting all of this idolatrous worship to Baal and Ashtoreth. And so the kingdom was just in a mess. The spiritual condition was terrible. And God sent Elijah. And he said, it's not going to rain until I tell you it's not going to rain. And until it's going to rain again. And so he, 42 months later, God allowed rain to fall. Three and a half years, it didn't rain. God kept Elijah in hiding during that time. He provided for him the whole time. And you know what? If you're God's child, God's going to provide for you. It doesn't matter if it gets bad around you. God's going to take care of you, so take heart. And then God told Elijah to go present himself to Ahab. And so he went to the king And they had a showdown. And at that showdown, there was 850 false prophets, idolaters prophets of Baal, and there was one true prophet. It doesn't matter how much that you're outnumbered, if you're walking with God, you have a majority. Because God is a majority all by himself. He doesn't need us, but when we walk with him, we are on his side, and we don't have to fear. And so God answered by fire. He consumed the sacrifice that was on the altar. And the people declared that the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah went and prayed, and God sent rain. And the land was blessed again. And Ahab goes home, and he tells his wife Jezebel what happened. She was furious. She couldn't believe that this happened. And so she sent a messenger to Elijah And the message was, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be like the other prophets that were over, the false prophets that just got killed. I'm going to kill you. And for some unknown reason, the man that was so brave, the man that was so courageous, that would stand up to Ahab and 850 false prophets run from the message that Elijah sends. And so that's where we leave ourselves today. We start with the story Elijah was on the run, and last time we talked about some of the roots of the spiritual attack of the spirit of Jezebel and how that they want to get an inroad into our lives. And again, when we talk about Jezebel, we're not talking about a female individual, but we're talking about a spirit that the Bible talks about, and it refers to again in Revelation, how that the spirit of Jezebel was alive and and working among one of the churches of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. And God told them, you need to take care of that spirit. Don't let it have a place. And we've got to make sure today, in this last day, that we do what's necessary to keep ourselves in line with God, in God's authority, in God's word, and that we do not listen to the, the evil voices and the evil spirits of this world. So let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us today. Jesus, we pray that you give us revelation, that you'd minister to us, and that you would just speak to us today, that you would help us to understand what's going on all around us, and that we would be that man and that woman that would be able to stand in this day and this hour. In Jesus' name. Our key verses are Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. And Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I underline those verses in the notes there because that's exactly where we are today. We're not wrestling against people. We're wrestling against spiritual wickedness in high places. And you can't fight that type of battle 
through physical measures. There's no guns that will work. There's no weapons that we have that, that will prosper and do, do the job that's necessary. But there is scriptural principles that we follow, and when we fight God's way, amen, God will take care of it. And so we need to put on the whole armor of God so that we can stand in this evil day. And more than stand, God wants us to thrive. And so understand that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but we're wrestling against these principalities and these powers and these rulers of darkness today. So Paul says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Paul said if you're going to be victorious, you've got to take the whole armor of God, and you've got to fight God's way. You've got to protect your head, You've got to protect your heart. You've got to protect your vital organs. You've got to protect your feet. You've got to protect everything. And God has given all of this to us to protect us as we advance in his kingdom. You notice there's no armor for the back because God doesn't want us to retreat. He wants us to stand and stand strong. God wants us to be his people in this day and to be like Elijah did and stand up even though we might be in the minority as far as human people would count, but we're on the majority because we're on God's side and we're following God's plan. And so, why did Elijah run? In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah was focused on God and his purpose. And in so doing, the Bible said he was at peace even in the midst of his enemies. He ran... Because in chapter 19, he was under spiritual attack, and he got his eyes fixed on his enemy. He looked at Jezebel, the message from Jezebel. He knew she was wicked. He knew she was evil. He knew that he had, she had killed other true prophets. And now he had the message out, I'm out to get you. And when he saw, the Bible says in verse 3 of, of chapter 19, when he saw the message, he arose and went for his life. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We've got to keep our eyes fixed on our master and our savior. Peter, when he got out of the boat and walked on the water, did fine when he looked at the Lord. But the Bible says that when he looked at the wind and the waves, he looked at the storm all around him, then fear gripped his heart and he began to sink. The children of Israel, when they were supposed to go into the promised land, instead of looking at the fruit and looking at all the benefits and looking to God to give them the victory, they only saw the giants. And they said, hey, they're big and we're small. You can't do this by yourself. We've got to keep our eyes fixed on God. Because if you look around and all the things that are going on in our world, my friend, you're going to run in fear. You're going to hide. You're not going to want to engage anything because by ourselves, we can't do this. So that's why Elijah ran. Because he's got his focus in the wrong place. And he was under spiritual attack. The church today, the true church is under spiritual attack. Satan is doing anything and everything that he can to stop us from being who God wants us to be. He want, the Satan wants us to be fearful. Satan wants us to hide. Satan wants us to back up. And Satan definitely doesn't want us to advance. But my friend, we are the church of the living God. Jesus Christ has found that this church on that chief cornerstone, and the gates of hell shall not 
prevail against the church. So, Elijah was a man on the run. He was a man that was out there trying to take care of himself and preserve himself. And any time that you get in the position that you're only in self-preservation, you're going to get in trouble. He fled Jericho, or Jezreel, I'm sorry, and he, he went a day's journey, the Bible says, into the wilderness. And the bad part about this He always had a servant with him. He always had someone to help him. He always had someone that would take care of the needs around him. But when he ran, he went went alone. He left his servant, and he went a day's journey into the wilderness. You see, being isolated is is a dangerous place to be, especially when you're under a spiritual attack, because we need each other today. And that's been one of the hard things we faced in the year of 2020. With all, the, with all the shutdowns and everyone staying at home and staying away from each other in the spring months and into the summer, and now we go back into the fall, and there's some issues and circumstances around us, and we don't get together as often as we used to and we need to, then we find ourselves, if we're not careful, we find ourselves feeling alone, feeling isolated, and when you're like that, you're vulnerable. God wants to help us. God wants to minister to us, and God has put us in a body for a reason so that we can encourage one another, we can strengthen one another, and if someone's going through a difficulty or a a situation, amen, they fall down, we can help them get up, we can encourage one another, we can bear one another's burdens. My friend, we need one another more than ever. But Elijah, when he was under spiritual attack, he didn't know there was any other one out there but him. The only one he knew of at that time was Obadiah. And so he ran. And he hid. He asked God to kill him. Just end my life, God. He was under a time of self-pity. He was a man on the run. And even on the run... It's amazing how that even when we might not do the right thing, we have a heavenly father that provides for us. So Elijah sits under a juniper tree. He falls asleep. He's awakened by the angel and given food and water. He falls asleep again, and the angel wakes him up again and gives him food and water again. Because even on the run, God provided for his man. So I don't know where you are right now. I don't know where, where you might be in your walk with God, or maybe you really feel like you've been under attack lately, and, and the devil's tried to convince you you might as well give up because it's, it's hopeless. There's no way that you're going to be able to do this. Amen. Doing all that you've been doing, it's just worthless, and there is no, there is no, there is no way that you're going to be able to keep this up much longer. God knows where you're at. He knows what's going on in your life. He sees what's going on around you, so hang on. Because God will provide for you. You know, the children of Israel didn't believe God when they were supposed to cross into the um, promised land the first time. And so God sent them into the wilderness. But one of the things we noticed the whole time, the whole 40 years they were in the wilderness, God fed them, God provided for them, God didn't let their clothes wear out. Because even when we're in a time of, of wandering, even, though, even when we're in a time that we're not exactly on the top of our game spiritually, God provides. Elijah lives off the provision that God gave with these two meals for 40 days. For 40 days. And he wanders around, and finally he takes refuge in a cave just to get out of the elements, just to have somewhere to go. He finds himself hiding in a cave. Now, caves are a good place to to explore if you like to explore. They're a good place to get out of the rain or the wind if there's a storm coming. But I don't know about you, but caves aren't a good place to live. And so Elijah really didn't have a plan. 
he was just a man on the run, and he found himself staying in a cave. God doesn't want you staying in a cave. He wants you to be about his business. So God comes along with Elijah hiding in the cave, and we see God as the patient teacher. He supplied his physical need for food. We talked about that. He ministered to his spiritual need by not allowing him to wallow in self-pity. He visited him when he was under the juniper tree, and he came to him when he was in the cave. Aren't you glad that God comes to us in our time of need? And so today, as you're watching this, wherever you might be, I want to assure you that God knows where you're at. He knows what's going on in your life, and he will come to you, and he's waiting for you to respond to him. God comes to him, and he allows Elijah to voice his complaint. And if there's one thing I like about God, the avenue of prayer, the avenue of communication is always open with God. Say, well, I can't tell God about that. Why not? God already knows your thoughts. And so voice your concerns. Voice your complaints to God. Tell God how you feel about a situation, and then take time to listen. Because most of the time, what we want is we want God to agree with us and where we are. We want God to tell us, oh, that's okay. I mean, you're exactly where. That's not what God wanted to do. But God gave Elijah a chance to voice his complaint. He asked, what are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you in this cave? He asked him twice. He said, I don't want you here, but tell me, why are you here? So he said, I'll tell you why I'm here. Because I have been jealous for the Lord God of hosts. The, the, the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant and thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left and they seek my life to take it away. He said, I've been doing the best. I've been a soldier. I've been doing this all by myself, God. And now they're trying to kill me. That's why I'm here. I'm just preserving myself. So then God comes and reminds Elijah of his power. Elijah comes out to the entrance of the cave. And the question is, why are you here, Elijah? He said, I've already told you why I'm here. And he repeats it again in verse number 14 of 1 Kings chapter number 19. Then God says, you get out there and you stand before the mountain. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountain and break into pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. God says, get out of the cave, stand out there, look at what I'm going to do. And God does all these great things before him. He shows him his power. He shows him they can bring the wind and bring the fire and bring the earthquake. He can do all these kind of things. But the Bible says God wasn't in any of those things. A lot of times we want the big displays of God's power. And what God wants to do, he wants to connect with us in our prayer closet just to speak to our hearts, talk to our lives, to reassure us, to give us direction, to give us comfort, to give us strength. After all those things, the Bible said there was a still, small voice. A still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle And he went out and stood at the entering of the cave. Because he knew God loved him and God cared for him. And he voiced his complaint one more time to God. And then God gave him direction. See, I'm glad that God speaks softly to us and kindly. 
I'm glad God the, is, isn't one that just berates us. Because God could have said, I can't believe you. I've done all these things for you. I've provided for you these last three and a half years. I rained down the fire when you prayed at the altar. I showed myself strong. I sent rain whenever you asked me to send rain. And then you run. Why are you doing this? He didn't, he didn't berate him at all. He spoke softly and kindly. Because God is a patient teacher. And God wants to put us back in a position so that we can be about his business and be involved in his kingdom. God's after test direction was to get Elijah back to where he needed to be. I feel really strongly in the Lord today that some of you aren't where you need to be in the activities of the kingdom. You've got scared. Now, you've been, got sort of lazy because we haven't had church like we normally have church and you haven't been involved in things like you normally do and, and you get involved in all types of other things and you spend your time doing different things. God's calling you back. God wants you to get back into the kingdom. He wants you to get back about the business. He wants you to be helping other people, spreading his word, amen, teaching other ones, amen, encouraging, letting your witness be seen out there. He wants you to get back into his kingdom, to spread his word all throughout this world because my friend Jesus is coming soon and he's calling us to get back into the kingdom. He doesn't want us to operate out of fear. He doesn't want us, amen, just to always worry about what someone might think or someone might do. And he definitely doesn't want us to be people that are self-preserving because he takes care of us. And he will lead us and guide us and direct us. He'll provide for us. He'll protect us. He'll, he'll give us all that we need to do the work. So God gave direction. And he expected Elijah to act accordingly. He gave him four things to do in verses 15 through 17. He said, I want you to get back to normal life. He said, go and return on thy way. In other words, get back among people, get out of this cave, get out of this wilderness, and return. If there's something in this Bible study that you need to take out of this, God wants you to get back into the, his work. He doesn't want you to hide. He doesn't want you to make excuses, but he wants you to get back. Then he said, you need to go and anoint Haziel, the king of Syria. And he said, go anoint Jehu, the king over Israel. And then he said, anoint Elijah, Elisha to take your place because I've got another man that's going to continue the work. And Elijah didn't know this, but Elisha asked for a double portion. And so he did twice the miracles of Elijah. Because God wants his kingdom to go on to the next generation and the next generation until he comes back. And so we've got to train others, young people and children, to take our place. Because they're not the church of the future. They're the church of now. And we need to steal it into them. And so he said, go find Elisha and get him ready. Because he's going to take your place. You see, God doesn't want us hiding. He wants us to get back to work. Okay, you made a mistake. Maybe you haven't done what you need to do earlier in this year. That's in the past. Just ask God to forgive you and get up and get back into the work. So I don't know. I've, I've done some pretty. Have you denied the Lord? Because Peter denied the Lord after being warned that he was going to do it and affirming that there's no way that I would ever do that, three times he denied the Lord, that he even knew the Lord, that he was one of his disciples, three times. So what did God say? He looked at him and they had eye contact. Peter went out and wept bitterly. And then several days later, after the Lord had risen from the grave. He had fish on the fire. 
And they caught a drought of fish after fishing all night and getting nothing. And Peter recognizes it's the Lord. He swims the shore. And Jesus has a conversation with Peter. He didn't berate him about the past. He said, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. In other words, get back to the ministry I've called you to. I know you've had a pause right now. I know you've made some mistakes. I know you've been in hiding. I know you even went back to your old occupation. But that's not my call in your life. So get back. God wants to give us direction today. He wants us to get about, go about his business. And he wants us to do it with confidence and with faith. You see, you're not in this by yourself. And as I close this part of the Bible study, I want to remind you that God's got a lot of people around the world, and he's using a lot of them for his glory. So don't let the devil lie to you and think, oh, there's nobody else, and you're all by yourself, because that's not the truth. Before God finished talking to Elijah in verse number 18, he said, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. He said, there's 7,000 that hasn't worshipped Baal. There's 7,000 other than you, Elijah. You've told me twice, I'm the only one left. You're not the only one left. Because, my friend, we are part of the church of the living God. And God has people all over this world that are working for him. And so don't believe the lie of the devil that we're all alone and that we're just so small and insignificant that it doesn't matter. Yes, it matters. Make yourself available to God. God did not want the thought of doing his work alone to hinder Elijah, so he set the record straight. Today, I want you to know that you're not alone. John chapter 14, verse 18. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Even if you're all actually alone by yourself in, on the job or in the grocery store, or wherever it might be in your home, God's right there. His Spirit's right there. The Holy Ghost will, leave, will guide you. He has filled you with His Spirit. You're not by yourself. Hebrews chapter 13 Verse number five, it said, let your conversation be without covetousness. In other words, don't want what everybody else has and think that we don't have enough. He said, but be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God has given you everything you need at the moment to be effective in his kingdom. So quit making excuses because you don't have the talent, you don't have the resources, you don't have all these things, and do something for God. Be a witness. Share the word. Amen. Get into your prayer closet. Get instruction from God. Amen. Get alone and hear his voice, and then get about his business and do something in his kingdom. God is calling us to action. God is calling us to get back. He is not calling us to hide in a cave and to be fearful. So as we close today, I want to pray because I feel the presence of God here right now. And you might be in a spiritual battle and you might feel alone, but you're not alone because Jesus is right here with you and he'll help you every step along the way. Jesus, we thank you for your word today and we thank you so much, amen, for for ministering to us and speaking to us. And we pray, God, that you just help us to receive the word, that we receive what you have for us today, and that we would take heart, and that we would be encouraged, and that we would get about and do what you've asked us to do. Forgive us for being a little lazy. Forgive us for being a little fearful. And forgive us, Lord Jesus, for for not doing and not putting any effort into your kingdom. Help us today. Help us in the small areas, the small 
things that we need to do with you every day, to spend time in your word, to spend time communicating with you, amen, to listen to your voice and then be obedient and do what you ask us to do in the little areas. Because, God, we know that we are just a small part of the kingdom, but yet we are part of the kingdom, and we want to do your work. Help us today, God, especially bless that individual. Maybe they've gone through sickness, and right now they're just, they, they just haven't felt good. But, God, you're with them even in the sickness. Help them to have a greater revelation of who you are and make themselves available to you. Touch their bodies, touch their spirits, touch their minds. Heal them and help them, we pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' precious name. God bless you. We're so glad that you've joined us. We hope that you're in this, if you're in the Syracuse area, you come to church. We'll have church, Lord willing, this Sunday on the 11th of October. And we're on Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. And then next Wednesday on the 14th, we'll have in-person service here. If you can't come, Join us on Facebook, join us on YouTube, and hopefully you share these with others because God doesn't want you hiding in a cave. He doesn't want you fearful, but he wants you to be about his business. And remember, you're never alone. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.